that bad? Uh, no, 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 Bob, you good, man. You're looking. Don't you dare leave this goddamn call, Bob Brown. <laughs> 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 Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the show. Let me tell you now, It's uh, what time is it? It's about quarter to ten. It's like quarter to ten p.m. here in the U.K. And it's time for arm wrestling old school, mother fluffers. If this is your first stop on the Supernatural Strength Channel, where the hell have you been? And that goes for Bob Brown as well. We have technical yep. issues now and again with Bob, but it's great to have him on. You'll notice that air of mystery surrounding Bob tonight as he's blurred that background in. You're like quite enigmatic, mate, coming through that. But no less sexy. Let me tell yeah. you that now. Yes, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have seen Arm Wrestling Old School before, you'll know that the last show, the first show, we had Bart Wood on. Bart was unavailable tonight, and we needed somebody super sexy to fill those shoes. Well, we saw that man. Jimmy Sheldon in the mother fluffing house. Check out the shine on that guy's head. Excellent gym lighting, right? Yeah. Mate, that is good gear. Don't let anybody tell you any different. It's good. It's a good look. You're looking pretty, looking pretty stacked there, mate. You haven't been dieted, have you? Well, I'm back up to 180 from, you know, that whole weight cut thing, so... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Give, give us a bit of a double bicep there. Let's all look. Oh yeah, yeah. Pretty serious. Great to have you on the show, Jamie. Welcome to Arm Wrestling Old School, mate. Looking forward yeah. to having you part of this thing. All good. Yeah, stuff. I'm honored to be on this this one. This one's a good one. I like it. So, and I'll tell you why it's a good one. Because of the next man I'm going to introduce, ladies and gentlemen. If you are not familiar with this young man, his name is Eric Rousson, and he is a beast. Not only is he a beast at the table, he is also the man who founded the Arm Wrestling Archive. And that's what this show is all around. It's about the old school. It's about how it used to be done, how it originated, how it started. And I'm going to say that Eric probably knows as much or more about that, probably than anybody in the sport, certainly right up there. And it's an absolute honour and a pleasure to have him on the show. Eric, welcome back, brother. Thanks a lot, Neil. I'm happy to be here. Now then, mate, we, we got off to a bit of a blinding start, and we got some some really good feedback, but a lot of people were sort of keen to see what that next stage was. And uh, I think we've got plenty more lined up. Where do you want to take it next, Eric? What's the sort of, what's the next stage on? I think we're up to around the 1960s, I believe. Yeah, so uh, maybe we'll start off in the late 60s. So in the late 60s, um, Arm wrestling tournaments started being held in conjunction with uh, other weightlifting events, powerlifting events, um, so and even bodybuilding. So, especially in the mid '60s, um, there was one organization in particular, and associated with, in association with the IFBB bodybuilding. Right when the Mr. Olympia started, um, they got the idea to, as on the night of the Olympia, why not have uh, to stretch out the evening festivities? Why not have a World Arm Wrestling Championship? Wicked thoughts, so, I love it. So uh, the way the, the weeders liked the idea, so they ran with it. Um, they had a few events uh, before the Olympia in '66, '67 on the West Coast, but then once uh, Olympia, the Olympia went to New York in '67 and stayed there for uh, four years. Uh, that was sort of the big first uh, publicized arm wrestling tournament on the East Coast, and they they, they pumped it up in the muscle magazines. Um, so a lot of people who had arm wrestled, you know, with their friends, uh, heard about this and saw the ad and like, wow, I want to go to this. I want to, I want to prove I'm the best. <laughs> so guys like Mo Baker, Steve Stanaway, uh, all those guys from the, the early days, all, a lot of them, their very first tournament was the 1968 World Arm Wrestling Championship held in conjunction with the Mr. Olympia. Um, and, it wasn't even close. No one could slow down Mo Baker. Mo Baker had been arm wrestling in the lumber camp since he was 10 years old. He knew how to pull. He'd been pulling his whole life, and that was his opportunity to show the rest of the world that he's the man to beat. Uh, I mean, it wasn't even close. He, he came back in 69, uh, won it again just as easily. And this is sit-down arm, sit arm wrestling, but it's a wrist wrestling grip. So they didn't have hand pegs. It was uh, hands, non-competing hands clapped clenched underneath underneath the arm yeah exactly so that's how they were doing it uh in those years still but it was seated it was not stand up like petaluma um there's an interesting story uh one of the guys who made it deep into the field i think in 68 he was a teenager 
but he made the final four. Um, and sorry, this was 67. 68, he returned, but he didn't show up early enough to do the preliminary matches. So he missed his chance to compete. And he was, he was not happy. You know, he's like, I'm the best guy here. He goes around taunting everyone saying, I'll beat any one of you. And uh, a lot of guys pulled him for fun backstage and he did beat them all. Um, but, uh, he didn't pull Mo Baker that day. The year later, uh, Mo Baker was in the same class as him and he's the only guy he wanted to face. The guy made it all the way to the finals and Mo was seething because basically the guy's been telling everyone the only reason Mo won in 68 was because he didn't pull and, uh, Mo crushed him down so fast. <laughs> Mo Baker was the man in those years on the East Coast. Now, we, we had a lot of feedback on, on after talking about Mo in the first episode, quite a few PMs came through, talking about was there any sort of footage of him, people that are still in the sport that knew a great deal about Mo, and sort of what his technical basis was, if he had a great deal of technique. Obviously, we're talking about a, a time here which is, you know, techniques hadn't evolved uh, to the same level and degree that we see them today, but... It looked like more would have been mostly side pressure, mostly inside techniques. Is that the case, Eric? No. He learned to top roll from an early age. Uh, even on the lumber camps, they taught him how to pull, and he was all about the back pressure. Very mm-hmm. quick snap, but he was an outside puller. Very fast. Um, mm. So that was different. Maybe that's one of the reasons he had so much success, is that he knew sure. what he was doing. Um, he, there is a bit of footage of him uh, in Gary Roberts' archives, uh, the Petaluma, the Petaluma footage from the early seventies. Wow. Uh, you can see him in a couple of those videos. So I guess eventually it'll make its way onto YouTube. But for now, uh, Gary Roberts has some. So that's the only footage I'm aware of. Well, Gary Roberts, if you're watching this thing, Stone. Mr. Richardson's just giving you a perfect in. You should exactly. get on there and do something. And you know that we've got one of your buddies on here, Gary, as well. We've got the man with a tattoo on his city. He's right there. It's still rolling. And if anybody thinks I'm joking, am I joking? Have you got a tattoo on your titty of arm um, Check this out. Look Ooh. at that. Hey? Eh? That's what you that call That tattoo saved before. me like uh, about $1,200, I guess, in, in arm TV fees that I never had to pay for being a lifetime member. So, and it supported the buddy. So it was worth it. So, Bob, I think you were coming in with a point as well on uh, sit well, down on wrestling. The, the exact point that you just said, you know. Anytime you talk about these archives and things like this, and then there's footage, uh, all the people that are watching this show right now are going to want to see that footage. So it would be a perfect time for uh, Gary Roberts to try to dig some of that up and, and put it out yeah. there. You know, it would help him as well. Or anybody else, guys, if anybody out there, you know, because so many unsung heroes, people out there, if you've got, if, you know, if you've got our method, our way of getting some of that old cine camera film or anything out there that you've got of these guys that we we do touch on, that'd be, I mean, that'd be amazing. Be fascinating yeah. to, to have that, wouldn't it? You know, yeah. Eric, have you spoken to a great deal of people about Mo Baker in terms of you, the amount of sort of uh, digging and stuff that you did for the for the site? Did you speak to Mo himself or other people? I did speak to Mo himself several years ago. Um, and he, he was, he loved talking about arm wrestling. As any arm wrestler loves to talk about the sport, he loved, uh, all my questions. So, uh, it's been a few years, but, uh, he told me some, uh, some interesting stories. One of the stories was, um, that I thought was interesting is, so he won in Petaluma in 72, the unlimited weight class. And then the prize was a free, a trip for two to either, um, I know that year was a trip, for, a trip for two to Munich, Germany. Oh, okay. Wow. I think around the time of the Summer Olympics. Oh, okay. And, um. So you're going to stay at Oktoberfest. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he went there and then he was greeted by, you know, he went to a lot of different, uh, uh or, uh, there was things that were on the agenda and mm-hmm. he, um, arm wrestled every day he was there. People wanted him to arm wrestle and he beat them all. And he said at the end of the week, he faced Sort of the strongest guy they could find, who was a, a German, uh, I think he was an Olympic shot putter, shot put champion. Oh, okay. So he had pulled every single night. At the end of the week, he was faced this shot putter, big muscular guy, and it didn't matter. He, he was so, even though his arm was trashed from the whole week, he just crushed the shot putter, and they couldn't, 
they couldn't understand it, you know. So I thought that was a nice little story. And how, how how big was Mo? You know, in terms of modern standards, it's talking about a guy that had slots into the heavyweight division today, or was he considerably smaller? Because you see, with a lot of old time fighters, you know, they weren't big. In most about, cases, certainly much smaller than the modern day. He was about two sixty five. Uh, when he showed, when he showed up to Petaluma in 72, I think he bulked up about 20 pounds, so 285. I think he's about six feet tall. I mean, he's not, uh, maybe so five, he's like, plus feet. 100 pounds. Wow. Yeah, he's, and his mm-hmm. wrists, his wrists were, uh, close to 10 inches. He could, John Woolsey told me that he saw Mo Baker lever a 12 pound sledgehammer. So lever, front lever. So holding a 12 pound mm-hmm. sledge. By, by, uh, by the end, facing forward, sorry, I'll back up here, sledge going out this way, and lifting it up like this. Okay? I don't know if you've ever tried that, uh, but a 12 pound, 12 pound hammer, 36 inch handle, it's, I've never, John Wolsey had never seen something as impressive as that in his whole life, and I've yet to see anyone duplicate that feat. Uh, I've got an 8 pounder, and I can't do that one. Yeah. Wow. So his his wrists were incredibly strong. Yeah. Um, so I have a question. Um, are there any arm wrestlers today that have arm wrestled Mo Baker, like you know Richard Luckies, or even you know a very young Berzink, um, or anyone like that that you know of that's arm wrestled him? You'd have to go back further to John Woolsey, uh, Virgil Arciero, those guys. Uh, okay. But, uh, yeah. even he, before he, Lucky's. Wow. There's, there's probably, there's the last tournaments that I know, he, I know he competed as late as 1980. I don't know if he competed much after that. Um, so it's possible there's still some guys around who are active, but, uh, not many. That's a match I would have loved to see, Bob. Oh, yeah. Richard Lucky's versus, <laughs> versus Mo. That would have been, <laughs> because, like, hey, because a young Richard Lupkeys was an explosive mother flop. Uh, that guy was that we know blocked rapid. If, you know, if uh, like Virgil Arciero beat him when he when he was in town. Mm-hmm. So, so he so Mo Mo. Uh, I'll, yeah, I don't want to jump ahead because I like to segue this. It'll be a bit more exciting. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, I'll get back to this this question though. Um, so basically, Petaluma 1969 is broadcast on TV in 1970. East Coast guys see it on TV. So naturally, the top guys from the East Coast want to go and see what everything's about in Petaluma. First year in 1970, Steve Sanoway goes out. Um, he makes it, he pulls in the middleweight class, 200 pound class. He makes it all the way to the final. Uh, and he has a, a war with the defending champion, Jim Pollock from, from California. And, uh, it was a very close match, but Jim won. I think part of it is, Petaluma wrist wrestling a sound of table is it's quite different from I think anything anyone from out east would have been used to. It's yeah. a little uh the technique's different than uh so he lost, but he made obviously represented the East Coast very well because he did make it to the final. Mm-hmm. Um seventy one Mo Baker goes out. Uh so nineteen sixty eight, seven sixty nine Petaluma was won by a guy by the name of Dwayne Tiny Benedicts. And he was the 60s, he was the number one proven guy in the 1960s. He won the world's, uh, four times or three or four times. He lost a single match early in the 60s, but on a debatable call, like it was a fast start and it didn't get called. But basically he was undefeated at a time that Mo Baker was also undefeated. Unfortunately, just before the 1970 worlds, Tiny Benedicts had a hunting injury and he, and he hurt his shoulder. And he never competed again. So that that's left, and we never know who would have been better. But Jim Dolcini came on the scene. So Jim Dolcini started pulling in '66, I believe, 16 years old. The only reason he entered the competition in Petaluma was he didn't want to pay the two dollar spectator fee, and it was free to get in if you were a competitor. So he says, <laughs> "I'm going to go pull because I had to save me the two bucks." Turned out he was pretty good because he he got I think he made it. He made it. Pretty far into the tournament the first year. The second year, he won it. Wow. Um, in 60- oh, he, he beat Jim Paula. In 69, he moved heavyweight. He lost to, the, to Tiny Benedicts. In 1970, Benedicts wasn't there. Dolcini won. 
Did he, did he come from a strength background, mate? Did he? He was a farmer, I mean, uh, dairy farm. Uh, so hard to work his whole life, but he was yeah. not. Uh, you know, he he wasn't. He wasn't an arm wrestler before that, but he just, no. I guess, picked it up really fast. And uh, in uh, '71, so Dolcini's the reigning champion. He's from Petaluma, so he's he's a god over there. Mm. Wow. Mo Baker flies out. And his reputation precedes him. Like his, he's known as the three-time world champ, arm wrestling champ. So everyone's predicting that they're going to face in the finals. It's a single elimination event. They obviously seed them so that they can meet in the finals. That's what happens. Mo crushes everyone. He, on his way to the finals, he beat two previous world champions, champions from the earlier sixties. And, um, he's cool as a cucumber. Mo is very, very confident. Jim, not so much. I mean, he's won it, but he knows Mo's the real deal. Um, the match starts. Mo gets his quick hit, as usual, but something happens. He doesn't get it all the way down. Jim stops him about an inch from the pad. And Mo is surprised. Jim is surprised. And Jim just keeps pulling and pulling and pulling. And he's able to bring Mo back up. And before long, he pulls him over. And he was the hero. I mean... The wow. crowd went ecstatic. I can imagine. That so, would have been amazing. Now, Mo <clears throat> didn't have, uh, he didn't have really have any excuse. He doesn't know exactly what went wrong. But mm-hmm. uh, for the whole next year, that's all he thought about. He's thought about going back to Petaluma and beating Jim. He returns in 72. Once again, they meet up in the finals. But this time, Mo gets the job done. And he crushed right to the pad. So, mm-hmm. uh. Uh, he just he 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 put on weight. He trained. 1972 was the peak of Mo Baker, and mm-hmm. he was not going there to lose again. And so, Dolcini was he was he was he an inside puller? Was he a hook puller? He was a defensive hook. His remember like early yeah. days of Devin Larratt, stop you from an inch and just yeah, hold yeah. Him. That's exactly. I was it. actually gonna. That was what I was alluding to, Eric. In that probably what happened with 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 Mo Baker, he probably. I mean, everybody knows that you go for the hit, you go for the top roll, you don't make the pin. Or right. you don't make the dominant position. That adjustment phase there is then a problem for most right. people, you know. Right. So that's that's what it, if you get it right, it's it's the charge of the light brigade, isn't it? You either finish the damn thing or you're out of position and in the sweet spot of your opponent, and that's a, the classic example. But it's always entertaining to see that, isn't it? When it stops and it's like, oh shit, it's all now, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. I watch Bob Brown in the Masters yeah. World I- every year. I do. I do find it interesting uh, when you told me about what the guy did for a living. He was a, a dairy farmer. Um, the strongest hands I've ever met in my whole life was a person who was a dairy farmer who still milked the cows by hand uh, every day of their lives, and uh, just the, the motion in which they milked the cows. They're the strongest hands I've ever felt in my entire life, and and I'm including Richard Luckey's, John Berzink, you know, <laughs> all the great monster hand strength guys. And in my opinion, uh, I don't even honestly, he wasn't even an arm wrestler, uh, but his hand, it, he he made my hand feel like a, just a little girl. It was unbelievable. And huh. every, everyday life work. Well, not that Mo, Baker, Mo Baker wasn't a farmer, but that he just worked. He was at, uh, worked in a steel forge, and his his hands and wrists were working all day. He never had to do weights. Uh, just hard work and growing up in the lumber camps, arm wrestling from a young age. Obviously, that's going to help. Of yeah. course, yeah, lumberjacks, strong yeah. guy, very yeah. strong. Wow. Interestingly, uh, Jim, obviously you're close to Petaluma there. How how well known is it in California? The whole arm wrestling scene, the origins. Do you, does anybody, because there's a statue out there and there's the, you know, that historic reference, do you, do you see a lot of it? Do you guys talk about it a lot? You, does it make you feel more proud that you're from that area? I talk about it a lot. In fact, I was shipping today at UPS and, uh, I was shipping to Petaluma. There, there's a, aside from Luke Kent and a few other guys out there, there's, there's a new, new arm wrestler who, who's been posting a lot. You guys might have seen him, Paul Italia. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Looks like yeah. he's been, uh, he looks like a statue from Greece, then he's just ripped to the bone. Yeah, he's like a shorter Mike Ayalo, just jacked, right, Italian guy? So I shipped to him, and he lives right there in Petaluma, and I was talking to the person that works at UPS that, you know, I'm shipping to Petaluma, because she, she pronounced it 
I forgot how she said it. I said, oh, it's Petaluma. It's where arm wrestling, professional arm wrestling, you know, got its start. She's like, oh, because they know that I arm wrestle. So then I end up telling her all these stories about Petaluma, and I've never actually been there. And, you know, all the Petaluma events happened before my time. I mean, I came in in 05 where I was lucky enough to train with John Woolsey mm. in San Diego. And um, I met Virgil Arciero. He came to one of my practices. But by then he was, you know, more of an observing type of guy. Um, but I knew their names because early in the sport, you, you ask questions and, and those names pop up, you know, um, like I think, well, aside from John Woolsey, I don't know when Clay Rosencrantz started, but I, I kept hearing Woolsey and Rosencrantz in just about every conversation and, um, got to know them both pretty well. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, I, I'm always talking about arm wrestling everywhere I go, and it's funny because, you know, I talk about Petaluma all the time. I just i have never been. I, ne- I need to get up there. It's, it's like nine hours from me. Mm-hmm. So California is really stretched out. It is, I mean, the first time I went up there, uh, I, you know, it was my first ever visit to California. And, uh, I, 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 you know, it was like, i got to go. It's when I, <laughs> when I got there, the guys were with me and looking at me like, you friggin' weirdo. I'm <laughs> walking around like I'm in Jerusalem or something. You know, I'm like, <laughs> and then honestly, the guys were like looking at me thinking he's seriously yeah. needs to needs to stop sniffing glue. But you know, it's just got that it's it's there, isn't it? It's like yeah, yeah. If they hosted an event, I'd definitely go. It's just it's far enough away to where I can't just I'm gonna take a drive to go to Petaluma. You know, if it was you know like L.A. or something, I could go. It's only an hour away, but nine hour drive. Yeah, that's a good run. Yeah. Forget me, forget me if I'm wrong here, but there's no major tournament now taking place in Petaluma that I'm aware of. No. It's, you know, it's a shame, really. It is yeah. a shame. We're, I mean, not to get off topic, and we'll get we'll get back onto what we're here to talk about any second. But when was the last big Petaluma tournament? Does anybody know the last big? So the the world's wrist wrestling championship, I think, were held in Petaluma up till 2002. Mm. The last three years, it moved to Reno. Uh, in the last few years, in the eighties and not in the eighties and seventies, uh, the city of Petaluma sponsored quite a bit for publicity and prize money and everything. Mm. That all fell to the side. Um, so eventually, the tournament became unsustainable for for the town. Uh, so I think two thousand two is the last year that the worlds w- were held there. And I don't, I'm not aware of any other tournaments that have even been held in Petaluma since then. I'm sure there have been mm. some small ones though. Yeah. Mm. Great shame, really. Like yeah. a snapshot of history that's that's dropped away. It's always a it's always a sad moment when that happens. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, back back on track, mate. So that we were talking about Dolcini, obviously, and we were talking about Moore Baker. Moore, Moore Baker's dominance there reasserted in seventy two. Right. Um. What's next? So, before I go next for Petaluma, because it is an interesting story on the East Coast, I just want to point out that some of the I don't know if you, any of you follow powerlifting or yes. aware of uh, legendary powerlifters in the early days, but a lot of the big names from the 70s, they tried out arm wrestling. Mm-hmm. Um, one of uh, Bob O'Leary's first big tournament in Scranton in 71. Jim, Jim Williams. Jim oh. Williams, exactly. That's, that's what I'm actually getting to. Uh, a, couple of, a, couple of, a couple of guys who also dabbled, Larry Pacifico. Mm-hmm. He, uh, he only competed one time, but he won his class. Uh, John Cook, who's not as well known, but he's a very, he had a, he's super heavyweight, I think one of the first, uh, I don't want to quote exactly what he did, but one, a very, very accomplished powerlifter. And he won the first North American championship organized by Bob Lear in 71. He won the unlimited class, knowing nothing about arm wrestling. Um, Jim Williams, that guy, uh, so for those who don't know, he was the former, uh, record holder for, uh, raw bench press. He pushed, within, within a year or two, he pushed the record by, up by over 50 pounds, 60 pounds. He just kept increasing his own record. Um, so I think, I think officially his best is 685. I know, I've heard that in prep, in training, he, he once did 720, not official, but <laughs> just to give you an idea of a strong dude. So in 1971, Bob O'Leary, this guy lives in Scranton, where Bob O'Leary's from, and they, they're friends. And Bob gets the idea, hey, I want to, a highlight match for the North American Championships. I want to pit you, Jim Williams, against Mo Baker, the world arm wrestling champ. And, uh, Jim, for Jim, sure, he says, why not? Uh, you know, he, he had arm wrestling. He didn't know much technique, but he was a strong guy. Mo didn't really get why it would be a good match. He's like, 
Bob and he's not an armor, so I'm, I'm just going to destroy him. He goes, I just think it's going to be a good potential for a good match. And then when Mo heard that there was a, an eight foot trophy for the winner, Mo was on board. Mo, Mo liked trophies. <laughs> so, <laughs> like an old school Michael Tom. Now that's old school. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he comes out to the events and, uh, and so, Jim Williams is, is about six one six. I think he's about six one, but he's three thirty five. So he's a good sixty pounds heavier, sixty seventy pounds heavier. And the guy's bench pressing wow. sixty or eighty five pounds. He's a strong dude. And um, it was a two out of three. Um, seated wrist wrestling position. Mm-hmm. Um, first match. It's a tight match, and. Mo loses on, he gets disqualified because his foot come up, came off the ground. They had re- rules back then that your feet had to stay planted. Really? His foot came off. Yeah, so uh, interesting. Those rules disappeared, but uh, so he got fouled out the first time. Uh, the second match, it was a good tight match, but um, uh, Jim elbow foul. So it was one-on-one, one, 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 but no one has actually pinned anyone yet. The third match, Mo gets his hit in and he pins, uh, he pins, uh, Jim Williams. But he said, he said, if you knew how to, if you learned how to arm wrestle, he goes, you would be invincible. He said he had never, Mo had never faced someone with that strength. And he wow. said, if, if he could just learn the technique, uh, he said he'd be unbeatable. So Mo was very, he won, but he was extremely surprised and impressed by, by Jim Williams that day. Wow. <laughs> that's the, I, that's sort of the, that's the thing that I love about arm wrestling and about strength sport generally. I just love that notion that they can be the guy out there. You know, yeah. I, I love that. Yeah. I, lo- I, I like to find that, that gem, you know, polish that mother fluffer up. Just that, like get, find somebody who's got crazy raw ability and they're out there, aren't they? You know? Yeah. And he, Jim did keep pulling in Scranton, uh, but he didn't travel. He didn't train for it. So he did well. Mm. Uh, but eventually, and he usually, he beat almost everyone. I think the only guys who beat him were Mo and, uh, Roy Ridgely, another, another heavyweight, uh, from Virginia, who in the early 70s was, uh, you know, right there with Mo. He actually surpassed Mo around 73. So 70, 71, 72, Mo was the guy, and then he was surpassed by Roy Ridgely, 73, 74, 75. So wow. if we get back, if we get back to Petaluma, um, Mo goes back to Petaluma, for, uh, in 73. In those years, if you were the defending champion or if you were had a reputation, you got to buy the sort of top, top eight. So he didn't have to do the early rounds. Um, but his first, his, um, his first match, I think he won. His second match was a guy from California named Bill Harrison, who had been pulling for several years in Petaluma. He had never won it, but he would often get near the top. And uh, he beat Mo Baker. And, uh, Mo Baker, his very first match, Mo may have been tired because the first guy Mo faced was a, it was a grinder that Mo won, but maybe his conditioning wasn't there. It's not clear. He didn't, you give an excuse, but mm-hmm. Bill Harrison beat Mo and he went on to win the title. Jim was not in the tournament because a month or two before he broke up a bar fight and he got stabbed. So he was recovering. So, uh, so it's too bad that we never got those matches. So Mo never returned to Petaluma after that. Mo sort of, he didn't officially retire, but he became a lot less active after that. How, how old was he around this time, mate? We're talking really old, old, like Bob's he, age? He yeah. was only 33 years old. 33. A bit older than Bob, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what anyway. are you now, Bob? You're like, what, 38? Yeah, 38. <laughs> Let's just go with that. <laughs> so I, he competed a bit after that, but it was more for fun uh, in his in his late 30s. Mm-hmm. Uh, but in 74, every, basically everyone else was in Petaluma. Jim returned and he, he beat, uh, John Wolsey. He beat Virgil Arciero and he basically did the same thing in 75. So 70, 71, 74, 75. Jim Dolcini, he was arguably, uh, you know, he's right. The, in my, according to me, he was the number one guy in the world in, in those years. A lot of uh, footage of, of Jim competing, mate, or not so much? Gary Roberts, once again, he has most of the Petaluma events, so he's in uh, some of Gary Roberts' footage. Oh, Gary, it's all about you. <laughs> <on the back laughs> this, Gary, come on, you got to get that footage out. Get, get it out there. Serious. Get it uh, out there. So now getting back to Bob's earlier question, 
John, John Wolsey and Virgil had pulled uh, with uh, Mo um, a couple of times in practice, you know, not in the tournament. Um, and uh, he, he, they could beat him because Mo was more of a puller, sort of like a Travis Bajan. Very quick snap, quick hit. But if you get him tied up, that's not a specialty. You know, a long match, he's, he's probably not going to, he doesn't have the endurance and he's, he's not going to, not going to do so well. So <clears> they, could, they would beat Mo in practice, but when they would face him in the tournament, they would lose and it would frustrate them and Mo would find that hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. But, uh, so but basically, Dull City, pardon? That much at all. Say again, Bob? I said arm wrestling just hasn't changed that much at all. Guys <laughs> all the time. You go to a tournament, they whip your ass. Everyone complains. Everyone's upset. See, it's the same 50 years later. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Well, one question I've got here, mate. Obviously, we've heard about um, um, Mo and so on. But there's still, at this point in time, we've still got the three broad weight divisions. And we lightweight, middleweight, heavyweight. Any sort of documented or much documented um, either footage or just note around the guys who were winning at lightweight or middleweight because you know that Engin Terzi somewhere is picking up this episode and he's like, no focus on the lightweights, you bastards. <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, so you're right. There was a three-way class for, for, for a long time. Petaluma added uh, a 150 class in 1973. Mm-hmm. So then there were four. Uh, in the 200-pound class, Jim Pollock California won the world, I think, five times. So he was at 200 pounds, definitely on the West Coast. He was the man to beat. East Coast, it would have been Steve Stanaway in the early 70s. Al Turner came around in 72. So Al Turner at 200 pounds. He was already in his mid-40s when he started. Um, but between his mid-40s and his early 50s, I mean, he was he was something else. He had sort of a... I don't know if it's a bone lock per se. Not, not, he wouldn't do a king's move bone lock, but he'd find a way to, you know, stop you sort of in an open position. Yeah, not, like a not, hang, not as, not as hanging position. drag hook. Yeah. Right. And he would give people fits. You know, he would, he would win these grind out matches and he would, wherever he would go, he would travel quite a bit and he'd, he'd impress everyone. Like John, John Woolsey told me at a time when, when, uh, Al went to a, a tournament on the West Coast, he had never seen something more, somebody more impressive. Because he was probably in his late forties at the time, mm. and you know, beating people half his age, and he was mm. so two hundred pounds. He was definitely one of the top guys. It's interesting. We had Richard Lutkey's on on um, the Deep Inside series, and he, he said that Al Turner was the sparring partner of Rocky Marciano. Yeah. It's another amazing fact. I mean, what you know? That's one to pluck out your pocket, isn't it? That's mega. Yeah. yeah. Sparring partner of Rocky Marciano. Amazing stuff. Never knew that until Richard came on the other day. I'd never heard that mentioned. Massive amount of info about Al Turner, but that one just, you know, has been like, yeah. For, uh, for yeah. giving an idea of some of his strengths, he could do, uh, he could hold, uh, at a night, a one arm chin up holding a 90 degree angle, a 90 degree angle, but with holding a 75 pound dumbbell. So that's Jesus. pretty good. <laughs> at around, at around 200, 200 pounds body weight. Yes. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's impressive. Yeah. yeah, that is impressive. That's really, really good. Uh, mm. The uh, he he also he's famous for. Um, I'll try to like to do the table curl. I don't know if you've ever you've ever done a table curl where you put a, a dumbbell on a arm wrestling table and you sort of rock it back, holding a ninety degree angle. Yeah. Uh, he yeah. could do two hundred and seventeen on a one hand uh, table curl. Wow. Uh, um, and then Virgil Arciero. Uh, was very great. Same movement, and he did I think 245. I mean, these guys were extremely strong in the in the, in the 90 degree lock position. Sounds like a good way to lose your bicep tendon, <laughs> <laughs> doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And you're into your strict girl stuff, Jamie. You don't mind a strict girl? Yeah. I, when I was <laughs> still working, you know, for a store, I went back and and I, I'm by no means like you know crazy strong, but I, I beat one of the quote unquote records for my lunch break in, in the straight curl at 154. When I was weighing 154 pounds, I curled, I think it was 165 or something like that. And I filmed it and I put it on. Well, I talked to Dave DePew because he does a lot of these. And I said, well, what are the rules? All right, I keep my butt against the wall, back against the wall. Feet have to be less than a foot away from the wall. And I did it relatively easy. 
And, I mean, I haven't gone much heavier than that. But, uh, yeah, I, I definitely believe that an arm wrestler could go crush that record. I mean, RBJ, I think he picked up 176, no problem. Um, but, yeah, yeah, strict curling is fun. I, I just do it occasionally, but it's – as you get heavier, it's a lot harder. That's for sure. So if I was still 150 pounds, maybe, but yeah. Well, didn't some plank off break a record in strict curl? It's got like 113 kilo. <laughs> something crazy. Yeah. He, yeah, it's something nuts. 75. It's right around there, isn't it? It's like oh, yeah. heavy, like 130, 110 kilo, something like that. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah, just waiting for the ping, ping. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I heard the other day that Larry Wheels is now going for the. He wants to. He wants to match that. I think Larry Wheels posted like a ninety kilo. Yeah, he did one hundred ninety-eight. Which, I mean, the guy could pick up nine hundred pounds, but I, I, I could see him doing a heck of a lot more than that. It just didn't seem like it was that high of a number. Maybe because I'm not too far away from that, and I'm, I'm not a strength guy, you know, so. There's an arm wrestler out there that could go beat that no problem somewhere, you know. You you, you do get the feeling that that could be doable. I mean, yeah. it's interesting. I mean, strength crossover got perked my sort of interest earlier in this episode, uh, straight off the bat when Eric said, you know, uh, they were doing this at the Olympia and there was a crossover. They thought, oh, we can put it on an arm wrestling show. Even now, you know, you you see. The Arnold Classic, the Arnold Strongman. There's sort of there's always been that real crossover, but mm-hmm. never so much um, with what I'm going to describe as the fringe sport element. So you know, arm wrestling, grip strength, strict curling, things like that. You know, that's that's and, and yet within that crowd, you know, there's so many guys that are like, oh, I'd love to see that. You know, it's just yeah. that almost because of the weird factor because you don't see that a great deal. Right. You know? Yep. And how many people do both? I mean, I think last time I saw Eric, he flew to California to do arm wrestling and strength competitions in the same day, right? So you were like at both. Yeah. Which is yeah. pretty impressive because, you know, most people can't do that, you know. But, but yeah, yeah, I mean, Eric, you hold, don't you hold like records in grip strength as well? I have a few weight class records for some events, yeah. I yeah. mean, you're a shy guy. You're not the person that has the old mug. With the, the titles on, but just give us a rundown on your grip accolades because they are impressive. Uh, yeah, I've, I've won the Canadian, Canadian championships five years in a row. Uh, I've won, uh, medals at the world, uh, world arm lifting championship, gold medals at the world arm lifting championships. I've gone to California for several, uh, events. Uh, my specialty are, are the thick, thick handled lifts. So the, uh, double overhand axial deadlift, rolling thunder. Those those are my my pet lifts, mm-hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I, I like it because it goes well with arm wrestling. You, can't, uh, you know, a strong hands never going to hurt you in arm wrestling. So uh, no, no. Uh, so How much and it's up? it's quite. How much did you pick up with your rolling thunder? Uh, in competition, my best is two forty two. I've done that on three times. Wow, that's bloody mega! Yeah. <laughs> and if you've never had a go the rolling thunder lift, I'll give that one a shot. Two forty two. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Good. Yeah. Axel, I got. I, I just missed locking out 440 on a double overhand two inch axle deadlift. Yeah. That's so that's crazy. Good. Yeah. And what's well, your body weight, Eric? Like 198 ish? 205. 205. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How big is your hand? My hand isn't that big. It's it's uh, eight, eight, eight inches and maybe an eight and one eighth in length. So uh, it's less than RVJ? Oh yeah, yeah, RBJ is okay. length. <laughs> and I don't have a great span, so my length is pretty good. But span, so how how far you can get your pinky and, and thumb? Yeah, uh, I don't. That helps for certain events, and I I don't have a very good span, so for some events it's a, a disadvantage. But for anything that's a big handle, that's I'm pretty good at that. Yeah. Oh. Uh, is it Storm pretty solid at that as well? Storm, especially he's he's done it just for fun, but him it's his wrists. His wrists are so strong. Um, he's, he, we, he's done a couple of group events and we bug him to do more, but he, he's focused his arm wrestling, understandably. Uh, but his wrists are insane. I mean, it's crazy, crazy. Like you say, there's so much crossover. I remember we're at the, uh, I think it was the Arnold's, one of the, one of the big strongman gigs. We're there with, um, Magnus Samuelson, um, <laughs> arm wrestler. 
I'm world's strongest man. And he just picked up a set of captains of crush grippers and just, I can't even remember what number. It might have been a number three. But he, he, cr- he, 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 he just cracked out two reps like it was a pair of fucking castanets. He just went, Psh! you know, like, and I remember Stuart Sarum like, what the, like, and this was quite, early. I said, do you, do you train with us? He's like, no, but they're good. Like, no, it's heavy grip. And I, you do think that, you know, the guys out there, again, farmer all his life. When Richard Lupkeys was on, he was telling me some of the things he did just labouring, you know, moving barrels and things. Criminally heavy weights, like over 200 kilos, and he wasn't a heavy guy. And they just had a rim on the barrel, and it's, a, you know, the thing's filled with fluid, and it's moving about. Can you imagine? That's nuts. So the, the kind of grip that you need to do, you would develop doing that regularly. Yeah. And it's fascinating what kind of crossover you see from other things like, you know, mechanics, rock climbers, things of that nature. I'd love to see how some of those guys went. You, you top rock climbers. I bet they've got some silly grip. Yeah. Oh, yeah. In grip sport, uh, that's some the, the new king of grip sport is, uh, uh, a climber by the name of Tanner Merkel out of Texas. He's, uh, 180 pounds. I think he's gained, he's about 200 pounds now, but he is, uh, he's distancing himself from the pack. And it doesn't matter how big you are. He's a climber. Uh, mm. And his hands, he's good at everything. His hands are unbelievable. And he's done a bit of arm wrestling, the tended to practices, and he has the hand, but it's obviously it's his bicep lock that he has to work on. But yeah, uh, he, it's, it's incredible. He's right now, he's the, the wonder kid of, of grip right now. Now, it, the, the next one I wanted to ask, and I know that we, the, the question came up. Somebody, I can't remember who it was. Sorry, I would throw the name in there. I generally can't remember, but he threw in about, um, all that viscera. Jamie's here. Alan Fisher. Because as everybody knows, Alan swiftly approaching his 300th birthday. And we wondered when he got involved. Because <clears throat> I know he was in, obviously he was in over the top in the late 80s. But when was uh, Alan first prominent in Petaluma? When did we see Alan first get in the mix? 79 is when he started. Um, he he made Petaluma. I don't know if he was there in 80. In 81, he, he went to Petaluma. Uh, he pulled the 150 class. So that's light for Alan. Mm-hmm. And he, he had a match with, uh, he was eliminated by Dave Patton. Okay. Um, the following year in 82, uh, Fisher pulled this 175 class. Dave pulled both the 150 and the 175. Patton won the 150, uh, but he lost to Fisher in the 75 in 82. Wow. Yeah. Um, and that's a, that's a man with some stats, isn't it? Um, <laughs> <laughs> what a physique for arm wrestling that kid has got. In the, whoa! Talk about crafted by the gods and handed thee down. Yeah. That's a hand, you know. <laughs> in fact, I, I don't think he ever used it as well as he could because he's so gifted. If Alan had ever been, like, elusive on the hand, can you imagine he'd have been... Just crazy. He often left his hand behind. But mm-hmm. yeah. Explosive individual. You ever pulled up with Alan, Bob? Uh, yeah, I pulled it. Alan, Cobra, Dave Patton. I pulled all of them. Um, I've never pulled Alan in a tournament. Uh, and honestly, what I've always said about Alan, and, I, and, I, and, I, and of course his hand was mega strong, but when I compared it to other hands, Alan's hand was really hard to get a hold of. Because it was so big, but from a strength standpoint, <clears throat> wasn't as strong as say Cobra Rhodes. Like Cobra Rhodes, I could get a really good hold of Cobra's hand because it was a thinner hand; it was a smaller hand. But Cobra's hand was much stronger than Allen. It was just that Allen, the size of his hand, made up for the. I hate to use the word lack of strength because it was mega strong. But when you compare it to Cobra's hands, it was not as strong as Cobra's hands. Uh, but I've never pulled Allen in a tournament. I've only pulled Dave Patton and Cobra Rhodes in tournaments, uh, but never, never Allen. How did, how did Dave's hand compare? Dave's hand was not as strong as either one of their hands. Uh, Dave's hand I could deal with fine. My hand honestly, one of the best compliments I ever got from Dave is after he beat me at a Yukon Jack tournament, he hooked me 
And I went up to him and I said, why did you hook me? And he goes, Bob, honestly, I was afraid of your hand. And I was, you know, that was like the great compliment I got from Dave Patton, that he was scared of my hand. What made Dave Patton, his hand was incredibly strong. Again, I'm comparing it to the elite guys. But what made Dave Patton, Dave Patton, was his ungodly back pressure. Yeah, the post. Knuckles to the moon. That <coughs> was what made Dave Patton, Dave Patton. Mm. His hook was incredible. His hook was great. His hand was great. His wrist was great. His fingers were great. But his back pressure was undeniable better than anybody else's out there. Mm. Huh. But as far as hands go, honestly, if I had to rank the four of us in strength of hand, I would put Cobra Road, a very clear leader, um, I think my hand was stronger than Alan's. Alan's was just too big for me to get a hold of. And then Alan's hand, and then Dave Patton's hand. Interesting. Oh. Yeah, it is. And that's back when, like you said, rock climbing, you know, my days of rock climbing is what got my hand so strong. Um, and then arthritis later in life is taking, taking that away. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, it's a one-way ticket, isn't it? You get into strength sports, you better be ready for a little bit of uh, snap, crackle, and pop when you're washing your hair. Or in Jamie's case, when you're moisturising, mostly. (laughs) (laughs) It's all about the smooth do. Minimum haircut, that feng shui. Look at that, look. Not playing games. That brings us to about 46 minutes in, ladies and gents, until the end of this episode. But I want to thank my guests. First of all, a newcomer, tonight's guest, Jamie Sheldon. Mate, so good to have the natural in the house. And Jamie, what, what's the plan over there, mate? Is California really bad with COVID-19, or are you able to do any training, or are you on lockdown? Well, people are still having practices every so often. Um, I'm probably just going to kind of hold off from that. I usually try to go to one once a month. Um, I can't really arm wrestle too much. I, it takes away from my gym stuff, and, mm-hmm. um, you know, <laughs> once a month is good enough for me, especially with – well, now that there's really nothing happening, I don't really need to focus on that. I'm going to try to gain weight. But, um, yeah, I, you know, I've had a few people that I've known that have that have gotten COVID and, and got past it, uh, different extremes, some that were just completely fine, some that have been in the hospital. But I don't really see those people on the regular. Um, but we're just kind of keeping here. Luckily, our jobs haven't been affected. Uh, my wife's a teacher, but she probably doesn't have to go back to work. It's probably going to be all done from home, which means we'll all just kind of be hanging around here. Um, but, yeah, luckily I have all this behind me. I can keep busy in my garage, right? There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Nat fits on Jamie Sheldon. Great to have him on the show, and I'm sure we'll be back on here again soon. Yeah, thank Bob you, guys. Bob Brown, our other guest and resident guest on the show, Bob. Good yeah. to have you on here as always, mate. How's life where you are? Is uh have you got anything planned, any training, or are you still just milling around? Well, no. Uh, a lot of people don't know. Uh, some that close do. So I'd like to hit a couple things up. On the COVID thing, for those that don't know, uh, and we're going back old school because that's what we're doing here, mm-hmm. Todd Damasio and his entire family got COVID. Todd Damasio got hit pretty hard, uh, but they're all fine. And they're all doing very well. And for those of you who don't know Todd Damasio, I'm sure we'll talk about him at some point on this show, guaranteed. Um, as far as my life, I'm back to training uh, full bore uh, because what, Neil, you may not know, is Craig Toulier is currently living in my guest house. And, I, no, I did not know that. Yeah, so uh, let's just say... It's taking a lot. We, me and Craig, we now have to, we have to slow each other down because we're going to hurt ourselves because we're still trying to work out like young men and <laughs> constantly like knock it off. You're going too hard and you know, <laughs> you know, having Craig here is amazing. He, he's, yeah. uh, his job brought him to Salt Lake City and long story short, He's living in my guest house right now, and uh, so me and him are training full bore. We've got arm wrestling practice every week. 
Um, super nice guy. It's been awesome to get to know him, you know, so much better. Uh, COVID hit the hit here hard, uh, shut my businesses down for about six weeks. Now we're open under uh, limited customer basis. Uh, I've had five employees come down with COVID. Jeez. All of them were fine. Uh, but, uh-huh. yeah, we pretty much, you know, I wake up every day and see who's going to punch me in the face that day. <laughs> <laughs> but, you make but sure I'm you pass all on all the, your best to, to Craig the Fury as yes. well. Good all in all, life is great. Life is great, and I, I really enjoy these, uh, these uh, conversations. It's fantastic yeah. to have you on, Bob. It really is, mate. And thanks again. And ladies and gents, last but not least, he is the backbone of the old school arm wrestling show. This is the man. And uh, before um, before we go any further, just tell everybody where they can go and check all this stuff out, mate. For those of you who don't know, Eric's put an enormous amount of effort into compiling all this stuff, putting it in an easy place. You can find it. You can go and check it out. Where did it where, where, where go, Eric? It's thearmwrestlingarchives.com is the website. And if you, if you like, I post daily factoids on the Arm Wrestling Archives Facebook page. So those are the two spots. Ladies and gents, you heard it from the horse's mouth there. Eric Risson, brilliant to have you on here again, mate. And thank you so much for everything you've done with the archive. Ladies and gents, this is your first time on the channel. Please like, share, subscribe, let everybody know about it. Uh, we will be back with more old school arm wrestling in the next couple of weeks. Until then, take it easy, peeps.